Thank you so much, Satan, and thanks to all the attendees and all the panelists. Uh, I'm, I'm just here just to say a few words because Primesh couldn't attend this event. Uh, as you know, his mom passed away, which is uh, very sad, of course, and he insisted gracefully on going on with the, with, with the panel, even though we wanted to uh, postpone it. Uh, and he was supposed to join, but unfortunately there are changes in the funeral arrangements. And so uh, I just wanted to just greet you and, and say that uh, on, on, you know, on behalf of all of us, our sincere condolences to, uh, to Premesh for his loss. And the panel will go as usual. It is uh, supervised by uh, Professor Elizabeth Georges and with Satan uh, moderating and taking all care of all the logistics. And in case you don't know Satan, Satan is the Associate Director uh, for Administration for the for the uh, Africa Institute and Elizabeth is, we're proud to say she is part of our staff and a star staff. So welcome. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Salah. Um, and I also would like to echo Professor Salah um, and pass my condolences to Pramesh and his family. Um, but thank you all for joining and to all the attendees um, and welcome to um, another book launch event uh, that we have started uh, last year. Today's uh, book title is Love and Revolution in the 20th Century Colonial and Post-Colonial World. Uh, I will leave the introductions for the editors and the panelists to Professor Elizabeth Georges, who is an Associate Professor of Art, History, Theory, and Criticism at the Africa Institute. Uh, but I wanted to share a few house uh, rules uh, for the uh, next hour uh, and a half. Um, the conversation, the discussion will go on for about an hour and we will leave uh, about 20 minutes for Q&A. Uh, if you could please write your questions in the Q&A box and the uh, it, Professor Elizabeth will, will uh, um, propose the questions to the panelists. Um, and if you have any comments, please do uh, add them to the chat. Um, Professor Elizabeth, uh, I pass on the microphone to you okay. and uh, thank you all. Okay, thank you. Uh, Satan said uh, we're pleased to invite you to the Africa Institute's uh, faculty and fellow seminar for this amazing uh, book launch. I've, I was able to read some of the essays in there, Love and Revolution in the 20th Century, Colonial and Post-Colonial World. Uh, Professor Patricia Hayes, who is National Research Foundation and South African Research Chair of Visual History and Theory at the Center for Humanities Research, University of the Western Cape in South Africa. Professor Arunima, who is Professor in the Center for Women's Studies at uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University in India, and currently the Director of Kerala Council for Historical Research in Kerala. And of course, Professor Pramesh Lalu, who is the founding director of the Center for Humanities Research at the University of the Western Cape uh, in South Africa, and currently a professor of history at the Africa Institute in Sharjah, are co-editors of the book. And they will be joined by, uh, of course, Pramesh is not going to join us, uh, but uh, the two uh, professors, Patricia Hayes and uh, Professor Arunima would be joined by Professors uh, Javid Majid, English uh, Eng and Comparative Literature at King's College, uh, London, and Professor Beruj um, Gamari, a chair of the Department of Near Eastern Studies at Princeton University. Uh, I will give Professors Arumani and Patricia Hayes 10 minutes each. Uh, well, we can add five minutes of Premesh's concluding remark, uh, maybe two minutes each for each one of you. Uh, 12 minutes each to give their opening remarks and then move to the two discussions for a 25 minute presentation for each uh, speaker. Uh, I will begin now uh, without taking any more time. You know, the, I, I'm now going to go through bios, the, the bios, the full bios of all the panelists are posted on the website of the Africa Institute and please refer to that. Uh, so I will begin with uh, Professor Arumani to give her a uh, remark. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Professor Georges. Uh, thank you also, Africa Institute, for hosting this uh, book launch. We are very 
happy to be a part of this. But as our friend Beru said earlier, we would have been even happier had we been there in person. Uh, I do want to start by uh, saying how sad and sorry I am that our dear friend Pramesh Lalu, uh, our colleague also in this entire enterprise, without whom this volume would not have been possible at all, uh, could not be here today uh, because he lost his mother a couple of days ago. Uh, a small and very nice story that he told me yesterday uh, when I chatted a little bit, bit with him. Um, he said that many years ago when he had been involved in the anti-apartheid movement as a student in the 80s, uh, his mother had felt that they hadn't been militant enough. So I think today's meeting is a testament to the militancy of mothers and uh, perhaps a figure that is actually missing in our volume. Uh, so it's something we want to think about, militant mothers and how they make revolutions and love possible. Um, very quickly, uh, because I'm sure Patricia has uh, very important things to share with us about the history of this project and how it all came together. Um, the kinds of trajectories that it's taken and so on. I just want to flag a few issues, which I'm sure Behrouz and Javed will speak about at great length. Um, uh, I should also add that we do have an essay in our volume by Javed, but we unfortunately don't have one by Behrouz. Uh, he escaped our clutches. He did present a fantastic paper, but he went and published it before we could actually put this together. Um, what those of you who will eventually, I hope, read the volume will see is that uh, it has different kinds of dimensions. Uh, the volume works at different levels. It's not very predictable. Uh, yes, the title does say love and revolution, and we have certain expectations of both those terms. They are such highly over, sort, of, uh, sort of overloaded terms in many ways. Um, what you will see in the volume are questions about personal and political desires, uh, ethical and political concerns, uh, various kinds of forms and formations of camaraderie, um, different ways in which solidarities were formed and unformed and reformed, the ways in which poets imagined futures and thought about pasts. But also alongside with that, what you will see are deep concerns about post-apartheid and post-colonial uh, state violence and the ways in which uh, political repressive regimes have brought on not just political exhaustion, but also a great sense of sadness. And I must say that I speak today uh, from a location which is replete with such feelings. And there is a sense of great hopelessness. So, the, you know, in many ways, thinking about the making of this volume is also a way in which at least I want to think about a certain kind of political impasse that we are in, not just where I am in India today, but also in different parts of the world. So with that, I just want to stop my introductory and preparatory uh, comments. If people have questions later after Javed and Behrouz's and Patricia's um, remarks, perhaps one can come in and have a bigger discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you so much um, for that very um, suggestive framing of that, Anu, and for locating us very much in the present. Um, I also want to say how sad we all are that Pramesh can't join us on this uh, really sorrowful occasion of his mother's funeral today. But as we talk here about matters of love and revolution, we are with him and family and spirit. And I'm sure that uh, he is with us. Um, so we thank Pramesh, we thank colleagues at Africa Institute in charge of for this very kind invitation to, um, um, to, halt, to in fact continue a, a very long conversation um, that now we have the opportunity again to revisit certain aspects of it as we launch this, this edited volume. Um, and, and very briefly, the volume emerges from a series of workshops. Uh, there were four in total, um, surrounded by a range of other activities. These took place between 2010 
and 2012. And uh, the first was held in Cape Town. We uh, discovered there was so much potential in the questions that uh, were being posed together that we promptly moved on to a second workshop in Minnesota, a third uh, extremely memorable workshop in New Delhi, and then a final one in Cape Town. Um, and I think it was at the last one that we had the pleasure of Javed and Beirouz's company on that occasion. Um, so um, there, there were also other accompanying activities uh, around the workshops themselves and many conversations and journeys with different sets of interlocutors uh, in between those more formal meetings. Uh, so this book is a, a distillation of certain parts of that process. It's by no means comprehensive. It is just a distillation of certain parts. Now, we all had our beginnings in coming to this um, collaboration. But for us in Cape Town, uh, the conversation around love and revolution actually started in the undergraduate South African classroom, the post apartheid classroom. Um, and it was an attempt to start addressing what we call a disconnect, uh, which we write about in the introduction. This is a disconnect between post-colonial nationalist state policies and the popular aesthetics that had helped to usher in the change that brought South Africa to the point of democratic transition. And I think it will be certainly familiar in um, a lot of contexts of African liberation histories that many sang of love while the politicians lectured about revolution. So we asked the question, you know, if nationalist historiographies are doing one thing and the um, this rich um, popular culture that had emerged was doing another, they were both producing subjectivities and they were, they were both together in some kind of relation, but it, it is what kind of relation is that? So that was a basic starting question. Now the volume encompasses different regions in Central and Southern Africa and South Asia. Um, and in the larger workshops, there were many other geographical components. But just taking Southern Africa and South Asia for a moment, all of them with differing temporalities in terms of their anti-apartheid, anti-colonial and uh, post-colonial um, struggles and endeavors. Now these different constellations of time raise a host of further questions about what kinds of divergences and convergences there might be in terms of a framing around love and revolution. Now, love is certainly a question for personal and intimate contexts, um, which interestingly, and this was the subject of some presentations that revolutionaries often have a hard time talking about such things. Um, so there's the personal and the intimate, but what we found productive was the way a larger spectrum of affective states, uh, in fact, opened up for us new ways to think about politics. And um, if I think about some of my own work on visual archives from anti-apartheid and anti-colonial struggles in Africa, and just to pick up with a very salient question that was posed in an earlier uh, launch conversation hosted um, by the Kerala Council for Historical Research in India. Namely, you know, it's all very well to dwell on love, but what about hate? Now, when you come to a question like this, that it's that larger spectrum of affective states that remains useful in going beyond this book, hopefully into future debates. Um, one of the supplementary collaborative activities we engaged in over the course of these Love and Revolution workshops 
was, um, you know, reading groups. And on, on one occasion, uh, Simona Sawney, who uh, was at University of Minnesota and then moved to the uh, Indian Institute for Technology in Delhi, uh, Simona led us in uh, reading uh, Jean-Luc Nancy uh, uh, specifically at that time on, on the question of love. And um, inter alia, this gave rise to a very spontaneous poem by one of our participants, Okuchuku Nwafo, which he called Jean-Luc Nancy, Do You Love Us? Uh, in itself a useful and provocative meditation. But later I encountered uh, Nancy's work, The Ground of the Image, where the image in fact prompts Nancy to ask some very useful questions about the we, or as he puts it, um, nous autres, we others. So to him, there's an unshareability of the I. And this started me thinking about the unshareable. And perhaps here, you know, one can think of the partitioned spaces of apartheid and also the post-colony uh, policed and patrolled with considerable violence in certain cases. But this unshareability in a very suggestive way is complicated, interestingly, by the operation of the camera, um, which I write about in my chapter in the book on, which is about political funerals in South Africa. And uh, so I've started to think about how, whether one can say the camera precipitates a degree of sharing in conditions of the unshareable. And just a quick quotation from Nancy, uh, he writes, just as this click and its result, the photograph or the snapshot, they appropriate a brief difference, an imperceptible alteration that thus becomes perceptible, present, indubitable. I fix an other in a suspended hesitation. End of quote. Now, this suspended hesitation gestures to what um, um, our colleague Udaya Kumar at the previous launch in Kerala referred to as an amorphous state of non-sovereignty, uh, which he had um, sort of perceived to be a potential um, that the book uh, was was kind of uh, resonating with. Um, and he also suggested that we don't quite know what to do with the aesthetics of this amorphous state. Um, so just to say that these symptoms uh, might remind us that we don't sufficiently know how to attend to the negative emotions. Um, where hatred is in fact about reinforcing unshareability whether structural, spatial, or affective. And um, I just want to end by saying that this is potentially what requires our future effort of thought. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Patricia. Um, so I'll go with Professor Javid, uh, if yeah. you can give us your remark. Thank you very much to the Africa Institute for organizing this. and to uh, Professor Arunima, Patricia, and Pramesh uh, for co-editing the book. My condolences to Pramesh. Um, and thank you to other colleagues for participating. So, uh, you know, what I wanted to do today is to um, revisit uh, my interpretation of fairs after having read all the other chapters in the book. And I want to put my reading of uh, Fares Amit Fares into dialogue with the themes that emerged from the volume as a whole. And that's partly because I'm trying to write a book on fairs. And in doing so, I'm going to pick up on some of these the, the key themes. First, I want to say a little bit about what Marx says about the poetry of the future and the issues that this raises for all of us. Secondly, I want to reflect on the political status of mysticism 
in relation to radical selfhood, because mysticism played an important role both in the poetry of Muhammad Iqbal and in the socialist poetry of Fez Ahmed Fez. So what is the, so, so you know, their poems, uh, mysticism took a different trajectory in each of their, uh, in, in their poetry. So what is the radical status of mysticism in socialist poetry like Fez's? Can it be mined for disruptive possibilities? Um, thirdly, I want to consider another theme that was addressed was the question of masculinity in revolutionary romanticism. And I want to address that question. What is the status of masculinity in revolutionary romanticism? And finally, touching on something that uh, 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 Professor Arunima raised, I want to address the question of sadness, the question of mourning uh, that Patricia addressed, Professor Patricia addressed in her essay, uh, in relation to the nation state's demand to be loved, and the question of disaffection, which uh, uh, Anu uh, wrote about so provocatively in her essay. In short, is it possible for there to be such a thing as a revolutionary sadness? And in, in addition to dialoguing with these chapters, I'll also draw on Bell Hooks's book, All About Love, New Visions, which was published in 2018. So let me uh, begin by saying a bit more about Marx and the poetry of the future. So in my essay, I discussed how Marx gave up writing love poetry in 1837 and uh, discuss the critical grounds for his rejection of poetry. And I read Fez's love poetry in relation to Marx's rejection of his own poetry. I mean, Marx, as he saw it, uh, thought that the problem with love poetry was that it became a purely formal art. And uh, the art, it, it led to the articulation of an expansive longing that leads to dilatory poetry. And it's quite kind of interesting to note that when editing Marx's works, his earlier poetry and the fragments of the novel he wrote are cordoned off from the prose of his adulthood, as Andrew Parker puts it. So Marx is kind of seen as leaving poetry behind for political economy and history as he enters into a kind of adult male authorship. So to become an adult male political economist, you have to stop being a love poet. Um, however, in, um, at the same time, literary allusions and devices figure heavily in all his works, as Prower showed in, his, uh, in some detail. And also in the 18th Brumaire, Marx gives poetry a decisive future. So I'm just gonna pick out a few key phrases in the passage where he talks about the poetry of the future in the 18th Brumaire. He says, the social revolution of the 19th century cannot draw its poetry from the past, but only from the future. And then he goes on to say, earlier revolutions required re recollections of past world history in order to drug themselves, in order to drug themselves in concerning their own content. In order to arrive at its own content, the revolution of the 19th century must let the dead bury their dead. There, the phrase went beyond content. Here, the content will go beyond the phrase. So I just wanna uh, pick up a few issues on a few issues that are signaled there. First, once again, we find this contrast in radical writing between form and content, or alternatively, uh, because the, the, the word can be translated in different ways, slogan and content. Earlier, the phrase, the form, the slogan went beyond content. It dominated content. So the slogan dominated content. But in the poetry of the future, this will be reversed according to Marx. But more interestingly, Marx raises the issue of the drug-like effects of radical uh, writing. So as he says, earlier revolutions drugged themselves according to their, concerning their own content. And this I think raises some issues about radical poetry, particularly in relation to Fez, but more generally, first rather like religion, which is seen to have an opium-like effect on the masses as Marx famously declared, can poetry also have a drugging effect impeding revolutionary thought? Can it have an anesthetizing effect 
on radical thinking? Might there be something anesthetizing about radical poetry like Fez's? And note here too that both Fez and Iqbal engaged with and reworked not just religiosity, but mysticism as well in their poetry. So the combination of mysticism, mystical reli religiosity uh, with, um, uh, uh, with uh, if you like, the beauties of poetry might actually intensified, intensify the drug-like effects of their writing. It might actually intensify the anesthetizing effects of their work, which would be at odds with radical selfhood and the possibility of acting in the public realm. So this kind of quest, these questions that Marx raises about drugs, writing, memory, uh, uh, and uh, religion leads me kind of to my, the second topic I wanted to discuss, which is the question of mysticism and radical poetry in both Iqbal and Fez. So as I said in my uh, essay, the Neo-Hegelian philosopher McTaggart, so he was Iqbal's tutor at Cambridge, defined mysticism as the affirmation of a unity greater than that which is usually acknowledged. And an affirmation that of being conscious of this unity, which cannot be grasped in discursive thought. So for McTaggart, mysticism was about an affirmation of unity in the universe, which cannot be grasped by discursive thought, by rational and discursive thought. And actually McTaggart, interestingly, was an atheist. He was a mystic who was an avowed atheist. And the reason he was an atheist was because he argued that mysticism inevitably led to atheism. Okay, and we can discuss that, uh, discuss that for further. In other words, for him, mysticism was at odds with theistic, theistic religion and organized religion. Because mysticism, uh, uh, and also another point he made was that mysticism denies the reality of the individual human self. So I want to pick up, a, say a few things about that. I mean, how then can radicalism engage, can a radical politics engage with these disruptive possibilities of mysticism? So the, as I said in my essay, the problem with, for Iqbal was that for him, Khudi, a, a kind of politicized, Islamicized, modernized selfhood had to be rescued from the dangerous seductiveness of mysticism. For him, selfhood had to be uh, carved out against the temptation of uh, loving mysticism. And for him, love was in his Islamist uh, version of a revolution. Love is not the experience of losing oneself as his tutor uh, uh, argued, but it's about individualizing the Muslim seeker and what is sought. It's about tying together uh, Muslim selfhood in reciprocal bound, 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 binds of individuation within a particular religious cultural framework. So what's interesting about Iqbal is that in his uh, Islam, for his Islamist revolutionary outlook, mystical love has to be resisted like in order to carve out a kind of an agent in order to carve out of some kind of form of agency. However, it's interesting to note that Fez's approach to mysticism is quite different. So Fez is a communist, but in his poetry, we find a kind of opening out to mysticism. So for example, I argue that in his prison poet, poem, Kerde Tanhai, um, Solitary Confinement, uh, he uh, reworks some of the key tropes and, lang and key images of mystical poetry. So what I want to do here is to enter a plea via Fez against Iqbal, uh, so religiously radical poets, and also other radical poets, and against the radical disavowal of mysticism's revolutionary potential. And I'm going to say a little bit about why I think mysticism of a particular kind can have revolutionary potential. So let, I'm just gonna make two or three points here. The first point is that in many ways, Fez's poetry is manifesto poetry. 
And as Malarika Roy in her review of the historical studies of manifestos uh, says, she notes the shift from pre-modern peasant revolutionary manifestos grounded in a language of revelation and manifestation to manifestos in the modern period grounded in an enlightenment language of human rights. And I would argue that Fez's poetry combines both. It resonates with the pre-modern history of manifestos as manifestations of revelation. So it actually is subsuming in itself this pre-modern history of radical manifestation, which we find in ra radical peasant uh, manifestos in the pre-modern period. But it also combines this with a commitment to an ideology of rights grounded in notions of socialist justice. So there's a kind of, if you like, uh, a kind of sublation of pre-modern manifest manifestos combined within an enlightenment ideology of human rights. So that's the kind of first point I want to make. The second point I want to make is that if you read Sufi poetry, uh, and this brings us to the question of Fez and how he kind of calls upon it, mysticism involves altered states of consciousness in which everyday categories of experience like space and time become plastic. So our everyday categories of experience become plastic categories. Uh, in, the, in this sense, mysticism can open up paths to an outside of socio-political hegemony. It can open up paths to an outside to the matrix-like -like grid of capitalist temporality and capitalist spatialization. Because the categories of space and time are experienced as plastic and provisional. So in this sense, the mysticism and its altered states of consciousness can be aligned to the consciousness raising projects of all radical socialist uh, uh, politics. So there's a way, the way in which we can use consciousness, the consciousness altering practices of Sufism, for example, alongside consciousness raising in feminism, communism, uh, uh, and so on. And in this context, it's worth recalling Bell Hook's argument, citing Eric Fromm's Art of Loving, when she says the principle underlying capitalist society and the principle of love are incompatible. So you can't have love in capitalist society, according to Eric from uh, The uh, Art of Loving, which Bell Hooks, and Bell Hooks kind of works with that idea in her, in her very interesting book. And she further says that organized religion interprets spiritual life in ways that upholds the values of production-centered capitalist commodification. So she also argues that that is the problem with organized religion. It reinforces production-centered capitalist commodification. So I think uh, when we think about fairs and my, uh, and I'm just trying to re re developing my argument about fairs and mysticism, I think it's wrong to think that mysticism inevitably is somehow seductively disenabling seductively disempowering uh, because it can be mined for its radical potential as indeed Fares does in his poetry. And added to this is another feature of mysticism that is relevant here. And that is to go back to McTaggart's uh, atheistic uh, celebration of mysticism in his essay on mysticism, where he argues that the mysticism is about the affirmation of a unity that is greater than that which is acknowledged, which is generally acknowledged. And I think we can work with that and think about Fares' poetry, if you like, socialist mystical poetry in relation to this possibility of the affirmation of a unity in order to think about the possibility of creating a collective subject. So the affirmation of unity can be rooted to the creation of a collective subject outside not just the matrix of capitalism, but also its militant individualism. 
uh, and that kind of particularly in its contemporary neoliberal incarnation, where David Harvey, for example, in his short history of neoliberalism, has shown how important the idea, how important the kind of militant individuation is to the intensification of capitalism in neoliberalism. So I just, that's just the first point I wanted to make. I just wanted to explore some issues around the kind of messy disruptive possibilities that mysticism can offer to radical poets in contrast to what Iqbal does to mysticism, which is to reject it for the sake of, to my mind, right-wing Islamist revolution. Okay, so, so I think that's the, the, the first thing I wanted to, uh, first area I wanted to explore. The second area I want to uh, explore is, well, what kind of self do we find then in this mystically oriented socialist poetry? <clears throat> and uh, here I'm just going to, Mal uh, Malrika Roy in an essay asks to what extent is revolutionary romanticism immersed in a culture of virile masculinity? That is the, one of the key questions that she asks. And in an, what she calls an outlaw reading, of some Naxalite poets, she argues that vulnerabilities expressed in these poems through the yearning for reciprocal love. So the vulnerability expressed for the yearning in the yearning for reciprocal love, both from an individual beloved and from the revolution, um, uh, actually means that it's hard to find, uh, to simply typify these works as works of virile masculinity, because there's a kind of vulnerability in, the, in this reciprocal yearning. And I think the, the question of the politics of vulnerability here in relation to love and revolution, and uh, 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 Patricia raised this question about radicals on the left, finding it difficult to talk about love. I think that the question of vulnerability, uh, I want to revisit that in relation to Fez's poem, because reading Malrika's essay made me rethink that question, because actually I didn't address the question to my shame. I mean, what kind of masculine self is there actually in Fez's poetry? I mean, in, in Iqbal's poetry, what can I say? There is a masculine self, but in Fez's poetry, uh, I, I just want to think about that. And I think in Fez's poetry, we find a politics of vulnerability. I think it's clear that there is a politics of vulnerability in this poem, in particular in his prison poem, in his prison poems, where this vulnerability is pushed to extremes because for the very simple reason, in prison, he was under the threat of execution. So we're not just talking about emotional vulnerability, we're talking about physical existential vulnerability in prison. And his poems articulate both emotional and physical vulnerability. Uh, in the face of the, because for some time he was on death row, in the face of the threat of e execution. And I think the, the question of the fear of death and the question of revolutionary love is very important here because, uh, and Bell Hooks actually discusses this at some length in her book, uh, All About Love, because as Bell Hooks argues in her book, contemplating death can lead a subject back to love. That is one of the arguments in her book. Contemplating death can lead a subject back to love. And she narrates how thoughts about death leads to an intensification of love for her comrades and departed friends uh, as well. Uh, and, then, and, and also she also talks about, uh, 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 as it were, rescuing uh, the emotiveness of death from the patriarchal stranglehold that exists over it in, in capitalist societies. So she has a very interesting discussion about that, about the death, the death cult of, of patriarchal capitalism. But what I would say here, therefore, is that in uh, Fez's poetry, the intensification of vulnerability in the face of death leads to an intensification of love and an intensification of the attempt to draw on loving mass mysticism for socialist uh, revolutionary purposes. And note here uh, that when I say this, I, it's not, I don't mean this, I don't think I'm exaggerating. 
because in Zindan TX Sub, um, a morning in prison, it's interesting to note how his compassion for uh, the compassion he articulates for the incarcerated extends not just to his jailed comrades, but to the prison guards themselves. So he's quite explicit about, uh, about articulating, expressing compassion, if you like, loving kindness for the prison guards themselves, who he sees as trapped in a way in the same grid and matrix that he and his comrades are, are trapped in. So uh, there's, there's therefore a kind of, uh, I just wanted to therefore say, I mean, I think it's now no surprise that I don't think there is virile masculinity in uh, Fez's poem, but there is in Iqbal's poem, in Iqbal's poems. And I think the lack of virile masculinity has something to do with the openness to the radical possibilities of, myst of a mysticism pushed into a secularized direction. Uh, so that that's uh, and here I also I, I, it was very interesting to read the essay by Pedro Monavil, apologies if I'm mispronouncing his surname, which is actually um, uh, about brotherly love and comradeship in prison, and about how student activists felt closer to their revolutionary dreams for Congo in prison than outside it, and I think we have the same closeness intimate closeness to revolutionary love, dreams, and anxious hope in Fez's prison poems as well. And interestingly, as I discussed in my paper in an interview, Fez paradoxically uh, says that going to, to quote him, going to jail was like falling in love again. That's a quote from Fez. Okay, so, so that's the, the other area I wanted to just think about, which is ma uh, virile masculinity in relation to um, the question of affection. And then I'll, I'll just come now to the final point, I, uh, final area I wanted to discuss in relation to other chapters in the volume, which is the question of sadness and disillusionment in relation to the nation state's demand to be loved, as uh, uh, Professor Arunima puts it. And this is discussed in both Professor Arunima and Professor Pramesh's essays, the question of the trope of sadness and the demand for exclusive love from the nation state. But I, I want to begin just by touching on uh, Professor uh, Patricia's essay on mourning as a mode of mobilization. And all I would say here is that she begins her essay by raising the possibility that mourning puts the world into motion, into movement. And I was struck reading that essay when I think about the kind of melancholy, the melancholia of Fez's radical poetry, which some might read as, uh, as too negative to be radical, too melancholic to be radical, uh, too despairing to be radical. But reading her essay, I think it, it made me think about Fez's poems as dirges for the death of anti-colonial nationalism. In fact, many of his poems are funereal meditations on the death, on the passing away of the emancipatory possibilities of nationalism. So there's a way in which I think you can read his poems in relation to the radicalization of grief that uh, Professor Patricia talks about in her essay, because they are really funer funereal meditations on the death of uh, nationalism as a project of emancipation. And that uh, uh, you know, brings me to my next point, which is that you know, I think his poetry, uh, and this again Duff, you know, resonates with some of the other essays uh, that I've mentioned here. His poetry is also about mobilizing other emotive possibilities outside the framework of the nation state. So the question here is not of protesting against the nation state demand for exclusive love and you know, by meeting it with the possibility that, well, as Sharman, as Sharman and Shohat argue that you can love multiple nations. It really is about creating objects of longing outside the nation state framework completely. It's not about polyandrous love to multiple nation states. I think Fez's poetry is, is about articulating 
objects of longing outside the grid and matrix of the nation state itself. Uh, if you like, his poetry is about not fidelity to the nation state, but emotional infidelity per se. It is the po poetics of emotional infidelity. Uh, and Professor Pramesh rightly argues for the need to contest nationalism's role in monopolizing political passions. I mean, we see this in Hindutva, we see it in the Islamicization of uh, Pakistani nationalism. We even see it in Britain today, this monopolization of political passions, uh, the demand to command exclusively the political passions of its citizens. And in this context, uh, Pramesh discusses the trope of sadness as catalytic for solidarity and change. And after reading his chapter, I would argue that Fez's poetry is not just a manifesto, it is a manifesto for revolutionary sadness. Here, the struggle is not so much over who gets to keep the trope of sadness. It is a struggle to, as I argue in my essay, it is a struggle to keep sadness vitally alive against the nation state's attempt to extinguish it. So what I argue in my, in my essay is that what Fares does is to wrestle the language of love away from the state's command of the language of love and to re-authenticate it, the, to re-authenticate the kind of exist, existential realities of the pain of love from the kind of extinguishing of that pain by the nation state's command of political, the pl political passions and its extinguishing of the need for disillusionment and sadness. It's blocking of the radicalizing potential of disillusionment. But this brings me to my final point in relation to uh, Professor Arunima's essay on sedition and disaffection as complex fields of emotion that need to be proscribed, proscribed by the nation state. So as I argued in my analysis of Fez, uh, as I've mentioned, basically his poetry is this intense effort to re-authenticate the language of love and sorrow by wrestling it away from the nation state script. But I want to add, building on, after reading um, uh, on, uh, Arunim, uh, Professor Arunima's essay, I want to add that in many ways, it, it made me rethink Fares actually, because in many ways we can think of Fares as a seditious poet, uh, um, as well as a seditious journalist. So I, I, I discuss his seditious journalism in newspaper editorials where he crit crit criticized prevention, detention, and public safety ordinances promulgated both by the central and provincial governments after 1947. So after reading Professor Aronima's chapter, I think, I, I think you know, it, it made me wonder about Fez as not just a seditious poet, but a poet in whose works disaffected sedition becomes a beautiful art form. In other words, what he's articulating is the aesthetics of dis disaffection rather than the aesthetics of affection, the aesthetics of disaffection in order to counter the vicious, what we might call uglification of disaffection by the oppressive institute, institutions of the nation state. So I think I'll end there. I think you've had enough of me <laughs> talking about fairs. Thanks for the opportunity to rethink my essay, actually, in the light of all the other very inspiring and thought-provoking essays. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's very inspiring. Actually, yesterday I was talking with Professor Sarah Hassan on, Fez, on Iqbal and Fez. So maybe he'll, he can comment later on, but fascinating. Thank you. Uh, so Professor Beirush, can I, uh, can I bring you up yes. now? Thank you so much. Yeah. Of course, as usual, it's a hard act to follow after uh, Javed, but I'll do my best. <clears throat> uh, but before that, I would like to thank the organizers and uh, to for putting this event together, and also, most importantly, to Anu, Patricia, and Pramesh 
uh, who put together this amazing volume. And uh, I know firsthand how hard uh, they all worked to make this possible and how much labor of love has gone into its production. <clears throat> uh, I was fortunate enough, as Anu already mentioned, uh, to participate in one of the meetings of the group in Cape Town. And, uh, and I have to confess that I'm still rather intoxicated with the hospitality and the camaraderie that they offer to their guests, um, especially the sailboat ride in the rough sea there. <laughs> a couple of uh, decades ago, I, I would like to sort of offer a very general sort of bird's eye view of the volume um, and uh, not engage in detail every chapter, but I would uh, mention every contribution there in passing. <clears throat> a couple of decades ago, when uh, the feeling and memory of the Iranian revolution was raw and fresh, a friend of mine in Berkeley, California, Farhad Aish, who went on to become a successful theater and film actor in Iran, asked me whether I knew what the main problem with the 1979 revolution was. I tried several possibilities, lack of clarity of objectives, no organized leadership and so on and so forth, to all of which he said, no. The problem, he said, was that there was not enough love in it. Uh, I dismissed his wisdom as words of an aspiring actor and playwright who does not understand the world of politics and revolutionary transformation. And now look where we are. Um, although I dismissed uh, my friend's words, I did not stop thinking about it, perhaps not exactly in terms of what he might have intended at the time. I think that what defines the inner connectedness of love and revolution is above all a sense of transformed, disruptive temporality, a disruption that makes possible the hodological space that Pramesh Ladu so carefully maps in relation to nationalism and in his contribution to this volume uh, on its, and its pursuing sadness. We need that kind of temporal disruption to enter that space. Love, or in more general terms, politics of affect, as uh, Siraj Rasul puts it in his chapter, turns politics and revolution into an embodied experience, turning something abstract, i.e. struggle for social justice, into something felt at the cellular level. Here love is manifested in erotic terms, filial attachments, sadness, suffering, pain, hatred, separation, selflessness, martyrdom, violence, longing as in nostalgia and belonging, which appears in uh, the irresolvable tension in John Sosky's words in his volume between depictions of the struggle as always ongoing and the, and the uh, melancholy for a revolution that never occurs. The affectual attachment gives rise to a sense of belonging, not only to a particular space, but also, as, and perhaps more importantly, a shared temporality that regenerates and perpetuates itself in novel ways through the articulation of old metaphors, as Paulo Israel so aptly discusses in his depiction of dance and masks. Like all other similar cases here, Paolo examines how Mopiku masquerades shed the residues of traditional feudal mentality from its ceremonial practices that seek moments of emergence, possibility, 
and dissonance at the trajectories of the Mozambican revolution. One of the highlights of this volume is in the way it teaches us where to look for and how to identify revolution and love. We learn in the book to heed the way revolution is lived rather than how it is organized or what it causes, what its causes and consequences are. In that sense, what needs to take with a grain of salt what Partha Chatterjee, as quoted in MS Roy's chapter uh, on the Maoist Nexalites movement in India observes, and I quote Chatterjee here, if the decade of 70s did not quite turn out to be the decade of revolution, it does seem to have ended up as the decade of books on revolution. Not quite. Chatterjee was not paying close attention to a variety of large and small revolutionary moments that has given rise to what Max Tomba calls insurgent temporalities around the world. Moments in which subjects altered themselves and their relationship with the world around them through the transformative authority of love. It is inevitable that once one speaks of love, and of course of revolution, one needs to think of sacrifice, which price is one is willing to pay for love. I was so pleased to see that the last section of the book is devoted to this topic. Recently, a friend of mine uh, reminded me of these lines by Saadi Shirazi, the great poet of 13th century, who says, Aashiq gul durug mi guyad gar ke tahammul nemi kunad kharash. Kaash ba dil hezaran jan budi ta fada kardami be didarash. The admirer of the flower lies, if not tolerant of its thorn. I wish my heart had thousands of lives to surrender them all to be in the presence of the beloved. Sacrifice, of course, one needs to keep in mind the deeply gendered feature of the notion of sacrifice. And, and I uh, already, um, uh, it is mentioned that uh, perhaps one direction that the volume can take after this is to highlight that gender dimension of love and revolution. Sacrifice, the price one pays for love, in the struggle has far less, in the struggle has far less allegorical meaning than in the poetry of Saadi. People kill and die for revolution like Bhagat Singh, whose life and martyrdom Simona Sani examines in her chapter. Bhagat Singh is popularly referred to as Shaheed Singh, uh, Bhagat Singh the martyr, drawing on the Islamic concept of the Shaheed, one who comes, one dies for the faith or dies as an unwavering witness to the transcendence of divinity. Shaheed comes from the root word of the witness. This is an important reference for it highlights the significance of presence, a presence that could realize, a presence that could be realized either by death or by leading an exemplary life that establishes different kinds of ethos for living. Reading about uh, Bhagat Singh and his martyrdom at the young age of 24 reminded me of the great German pacifist thinker and social anarchist, Gustav uh, Landauer, 
who wrote in 1911 that socialist praxis is not only a matter of personal virtue, of sacrificial love. Now, and I quote, he declared, is the time to bring forth a martyr of a different kind, not heroic, but quiet, unpretentious martyr who will provide an example for the proper life. When Landover wrote those words, words that would later be inscribed ironically on his tombstone after he was killed at the age of 49 in the aftermath of the defeated revolution of 1919 in Germany, he understood martyrdom as a metaphor for selfless idealism, not as the giving of one's life for one's ideals. This, I believe, also captures the core of Patricia Hayes's carefully crafted chapter on the photographic depictions of mourning that in so many different ways, and I quote, puts the world into movement. She borrows from Pierre Fedida to say that, and I quote, the world is shaken with a new mobility as soon as death suddenly appears evident. Together, love and revolution instigate a moment in which love, life and death lose their mutually exclusive temporalities and appear on a continuum in which living and dying share the same purpose, a purpose that remain unfathomable to the instrumental rationalities that inform much of the political action in the modern world. To appreciate this, one needs to move away from grand acts in their totality to the spaces that those acts unseal. A move that is so beautifully depicted in the poetry of Murari Mohan Mukherjee reproduced in Emma Roy's chapter in this volume. And this is the poem. Do not flow like a stream in love. Come as a deluge if you can, with the tidal emotion. I want to mutilate every dam of despair. Moon, stream, flower, star, bird can wait for some time now. The last battle is imminent in the dark. We yearn for a glimmer of light in our shacks. And I want to hide it, to draw your attention to the last line. We yearn for a glimmer of light in our shacks. Here to show the same sentiment, let me read from the poetry of Ahmad Shamlu, the poet par excellence of contemporary Iran. نه به خاطر آفتاب، نه به خاطر حماسه، به خاطر سایه بام کوچکش، به خاطر ترانه ای کوچکتر از دستهای تو، نه به خاطر جنگل ها، نه به خاطر دریا، به خاطر یک برگ، به خاطر یک قطره روشنتر از چشم های تو، نه به خاطر دیوار ها، به خاطر یک چپر، نه به خاطر همه انسان ها، به خاطر نوزاد دشمنش شاید، نه به خاطر دنیا، به خاطر خانه تو، به خاطر یقین کوچکت که انسان دنیایی است، به خاطر سنگ فرشی که مرا به تو میرساند، نه به خاطر شاه راه های دور دست، به خاطر کندوها و زنبورهای کوچک، به خاطر تو، به خاطر هر چیز کوچک و هر چیز پاک به خاک افتادند. Neither for the sake of the sun, nor for the fashioning of an epic, for the sake of the shade on his tiny roof, for the sake of a song smaller than your delicate hands, neither for the forests nor for the sea, for the sake of a single leaf, for the sake of a single drop of water brighter than your eyes, nor for the sake of all humanity, for the sake of the enemy's newborn child, for the sake of the whole world, for the sake of your home, 
for the sake of your small certainty that human being is a universe, for the sake of cobblestones of the path that takes me to you, nor for the distant highways, for the sake of hives and tiny bees, for you, for the sake of every small thing, every pure thing, they have fallen. I know uh, that Javed and I share deep interest in poetry and its deep effectual mark on shaping the way we interact with and understand the world. You can see that in his contribution to this volume, uh, through the socialist poetry of Faiz and Iqbal's mysticism, and in a way, the variety in, in a variety of ways, poetry is where love and revolution meet. My hope is that there will be more space for the kind of literary and poetic engagement if this project if this project continues. I'm hesitant to say, I'm hesitant to say this fearing that it might sound like aestheticizing politics. But I think that there ought to be a place for the appreciation of beauty in revolutionary impulse. Outside the world of platforms, blueprints, strategies, defeats, and triumphs. Let me borrow from Shamlu here again, Parvaz Osiani Favorei ke khalasi ash az khak nist. The rebellious flight of a fountain that cannot escape the earth and is simply trying deliverance. We create beauty like the fountain, not by what is gained by the revolution, but through how we experience it. The flight of the fountain is not in vain, for it generates beauty. Before ending my comments, I need to pay heed to um, Pedro Monoville's love is stronger in prison than outside for reasons that some of you who are familiar with my work would recognize. I should end here uh, where I started these comments with, uh, started my comments with and my friend's diagnosis of the failure of the Iranian revolution. In the concluding chapter of the book, Anu borrows from Bell Hooks, who speaks of love as a practice of freedom and the need for an ethic of love that will shape one's political vision. Martin Luther King Jr., Bell Hooks reminds us, had the, and I quote, had the prophetic insight to recognize that the revolution built on any other foundation than ethos ethics of love would eventually fail. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Berwis. Uh, I've only read about three essays uh, of this book because Pramesh just gave it to me a couple of days ago. Uh, but today's conversation has prompted me to urgently read the rest of the essays. Uh, the observation of Iqbal and Fezis uh, Radical Politics and Mysticism and Mysticism's Revolutionary Potential, Patricia Hayes' Mourning and Funeral, uh, Pedro Monaville's Imprisoned Subjects and Love of, in the DRC After Independence, I've read that one, uh, to Premesh's Nationalism and Sadness, which I've already read, which I've also read because I very much relate to the same predicament that's happening in my country right now, and to Professor Arumani's sedition, sedition and uh, Simona Fani's reflection uh, on sacrifice. Uh, so keeping in mind, as Professor Beruiz commented on the gendered dimension of love and Professor uh, Javed's comments on the masculine virility of, I think he said Iqbal. Uh, and you know, just many things to think about. I'm not going to, uh, we have a lot of time for question and answer. Uh, I'm not going to uh, waste uh, time. Uh, but somebody commented on, uh, which, which I think is, is so true, you know, so he said, uh, Neil van der Linden said, what an engaging presentations, first by Professor Majid and now by Professor Gamari, they're like a symphony. It is true, it's like a symphony, let's, let's love and revolution. Uh, 
Uh, anyway, uh, I have one question. That I'm, uh, please submit your questions to the Q&A and I'll read it out and um, everybody can participate in answering and responding to the question. Uh, from Laminata Diabate, uh, who is a fellow here at the Africa Institute. Uh, she's from Cornell University. Uh, she says, my query concerns two of your, uh, your framing terms, colonial and post-colonial. In the introduction, as well as in the essay, the reader encounter notions such as the, such as the colonial state, the post-colonial state, the post-colonial world, post-colonial aesthetics, etc. I wonder if historicizing these moments would have given rise to a different collection of essays. If we take, for example, the so-called post-colonial moment, the 1960s are markedly different from the 1990s which is uh, called Africa's springtime. And 2010, with the rise of social media, could you say more about the possible implications of a granular take on these temporal arcs? Uh, so I'll open it to, to, to anybody. Patricia, you wanna, you wanna start? And then we can go from whoever wants to take it on. Thanks, thanks very much, um, Elizabeth. And uh, I'm, I'm just um, glowing with pleasure from the, the two uh, respondents and, <clears throat> uh, and just want to say what, what a, a kind of beautiful electric shock it is to have the chapters in the book spoken about in these extraordinary ways with new links put together that also represent missed opportunities for further co-presence together. Um, and I'm saying this from a, a sense of the, the long periods we've all gone through of feeling denuded and isolated. So uh, just to, to say how extraordinary those responses are and um, setting up all sorts of um, thought processes. Um, this is a really excellent question from Naminata Diabate. Um, thank you. I, um, you know, it's very interesting the way in, in some work, one might be more critical of how periodizations are done. And in other work, you kind of fall back on existing categories because you, you, have, you have other tasks that are dominant at the time. And I, you know, I think that your question about the different post-colonials, if we want to put it that way, is very, very interesting. And um, my short answer would be that this would require another book, um, because you are absolutely right. There's such a different granularity to, um, you know, the, the, the whole uh, digital turn in different African countries. Um, the memories of so-called decolonization are at, on different scales of duration in different parts of the continent, or there might not even have been a need for decolonization uh, in some of the arguments about Ethiopian history. So there, there's a tremendous potential here to think of, um, you know, the different granularities of these more recent times and the different generations they represent. And I just, just to say that I, um, it's a kind of reminder that one needs to be much more critical about periodizations. Um, I think there's a reliance on work that the term post-colonial has done that's been productive in the past that we are also gesturing towards. Um, but I, I, I think a different volume would result if we took into account the, the shifts, the, the sort of um, 
intensification of different kinds of politics made possible by the digital in particular, because you reference social media. So, so let me just stop there and invite perhaps other inputs into this question. Thank you. Anybody well, uh, else want to comment on Aminata's question? Okay. Um, I can, say, can I say a few words on that? <clears throat> that um, I think uh, Patricia points to a very important uh, reference here that, that sometimes we periodize only to uh, use existing classifications mm. to sort of as a compass, you know, and these are sort of a, like a more formal periodization rather than a substantive periodization. Substantive periodization in the sense that, that, uh, that we want to draw some substantive conclusions from, from the way we are periodizing. Here, I don't see, I, at least this is the way I read the volume. I might be completely off uh, uh, because two editors are sitting here. <laughs> and uh, I, I, the, the way I read it, this is, this is more of a formal periodization that there is not a sort of invested kind of uh, intention to draw substantive conclusions from it. And, uh, and I, as I said in my uh, presentation, uh, I think these kind of broad categories of colonial, post-colonial, here we need to sort of move a little bit away from, from those classifications or periodizations to seeing things in, in smaller scale to yeah. see things the way they are experienced and lived. Sometimes those experiences uh, and the embodied sort of experience of, uh, of revolution and revolutionary movement have um, sort of broad uh, national global consequences. Sometimes they don't. And I think it's important for us to identify those moments uh, that do not result necessarily in in, in a lexicon, in language that is easily translated in reference to nation state or yeah. colonialism or post-colonialism. Um, and, uh, and at, again, I, in my reading, at least I see that kind of that aspect of, of the collection uh, that is quite important and I would like to highlight there. Yeah. Can I just come in for a couple of minutes? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, to start, uh, thank you so much, Javed and uh, Behrouz. That was absolutely wonderful. Uh, also, because uh, one can see the afterlife of the volume in a nice way uh, when one fears that it might have sort of, you know, fallen by the wayside in the midst of the pandemic and other such serious things that are going on. It's nice to know that it's actually, you know, people are reading it and thinking with it and taking it away in all kinds of other ways. So I, I really enjoyed listening to both of you. Uh, regarding the post-colonial and colonial, I think, Naminata, how are you? I mean, I was there for her book discussion, so we did meet virtually a while back. Uh, I think that the, you know, it's sometimes difficult to get titles, but I think what it also gestures to is the fact that uh, the volume actually has pieces that speak about uh, anti-colonial nationalisms, revolutionary mo movements, anti-apartheid uh, context. I mean, there are different kinds of ways in which this term revolution is imagined in terms of uh, movement histories. Uh, and that's kind of mapping a lot of this uh, volume, uh, and that's happening both in the colonial and post-colonial context. And this seemed to be the easiest way to bring that together, to say that uh, there are, um, uh, you know, insurgencies of different kinds and militant moments of different kinds, um, which aren't constrained or it's not as though the anti-colonial or the anti-apartheid uh, or the revolutionary seized or it produced a tangible result. It's not that one came, had a sort of um, wonderful future that sort of dawned after that, it didn't. And it continued in other kinds of ways in other contexts. And I think both these terms became quick shorthands to actually gesture to that. Thanks. Okay, 
Anybody else? Or... Yeah. Oh. Uh, okay. Like, so, just just yeah. very quickly, just very quickly. Yeah. Picking up on what's been said, I mean, um, uh, and what Beru said about using existing periodization as a compass. Um, uh, I think it's important to do that. The question is an important one, but I'm also struck by how the question is cast in um, assuming a kind of li the linearity of time, the 60s, the 70s, the early 2000s. Whereas quite a, a number of the essays and Beru's also mentioned this talk about the transformed disruptive temporalities that love and revolution might give rise to. So we have to work with the linearity of time, but also always leave space for other conceptions of time. And there was quite a few references to Badiou and the future perfect uh, as a grammatical way of thinking about other kinds of temporalities. So. Um, I just mentioned that because there's a kind of uh, another narrative in the book about temporality itself is at stake here and that we shouldn't simply fall back onto into linear temporality. Um, yeah, that's, uh, yeah that's, that's great. Um, I have a question from uh, Sara Yasi. Who, it's a very interesting question, actually. A uh, question for Javed. Given that for both phase and hooks, Fear of death or incarceration can lead us back to the subject of radical love. How do you think personally exile from a nation can fit into this understanding? I think it's really nice. It's a nice question. Uh, that's, a, that's a great, great question. I think um, uh, uh, it's an important question because, uh, as you know, Fez was in exile for some of his life. And I think the for him, the question of exile is relevant to what we've been discussing in two ways. First, uh, it uh, makes him into a, what we might call, a, 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 you know, it, it kind of makes the question of bordering um, an important part of his uh, work. It opens up the possibility of thinking outside the nation state of uh, framework. But also, uh, I think um, it, it's important because um, exile, in many ways, becomes an enabling condition for fairs, both emotionally and intellectually, and otherwise. Um, uh, and it kind of leads to a kind of cosmopolitan, a cosmopolitanism of an international politics. So in a sense, uh, uh, I think, yeah, it's a, it's a really a kind of important point that being in exile makes it physically more possible and uh, more possible to resist the dim exclusive demands of loving the one nation state. Uh, and that, that would be my response, but it's a very interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else want to comment on that? Exile and love and radical love? I can comment on that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> another another point of lived experience, you know, that that um, I think you know it, it's uh, actually I'm writing a piece right now uh, on exile and prison, and um, and the way uh, it sort of resituates the person in his or her relation to the outside world. And, uh, and, uh, and perhaps it's, it's in a sense, both of them, both situations generate a, a condition of exit. And, uh, and to become a stranger in a sense to whatever used to be familiar, and I think the condition of love comes from that condition of being a stranger, because you try to re-examine uh, all relationships that hitherto was given, and then you are rethinking. You are suddenly in a cell with 20 strangers, 10 strangers, 50 strangers, who would become 
inseparable part of your life in matter of days, you know, I'm talking about different senses of temporality, you know, that, that, that kind of forced, um, uh, uh, form of existence, which is what connects exile to prison. That, you know, in, in one sense, you're exiting uh, what, what uh, used to be your everyday, and now you are trying to uh, renegotiate it. Now you're trying to revisit it with different kind of points of references. Uh, the difference in exile and prison is that you know, prison limits those possibilities. Exile actually increases those possibilities. But in both cases, you are rethinking those relationships after a moment of exit. And that exit is temporal and spatial at the same time. Okay. Uh... Okay, I don't see any other question. Um, so it's 6.30, we're like half an hour early because uh, most of you were on time. Uh, um, so if you, would you like, would anybody want to say something? Uh, give an maybe we can comment? Maybe we can have lunch or, uh, or <laughs> depending yeah. on where but, you are. You know. <laughs> lunch or something. Uh, <laughs> But people have called, somebody else has commented and said, this was so very beautiful, thank you, on the chat box, and Nuzat Abbas. Uh, so I think this conversation has to continue. Or maybe there's another one, I see another one. <clears throat> no, thank you, uh, just a thank you. But this conversation has to continue. Uh, just a few months ago, I'm not a few, in March, there, we have uh, a yearly program here called the March Meeting. Uh, this year, it was called the afterlife of, it was named, you know, it's titled the afterlife of the post-colonial. Mm -hmm. And one of the panels that I chaired was on solidarity. And uh, I, I commented on, um, on the, what we call solidarity today. In the 60s, it was totally different because there was a thing called ideology. And this love for the, this ideology, this left ideology, uh, gave a sense of love for the human, you know? So you embraced uh, this ideology with, with a larger idea of love for all human being to, beings to, uh, to achieve justice and equality. But uh, today, you know, that solidarity, it, it, it rises up at one moment. Uh, I mean, two years ago with the George Floyd shooting in, in America, uh, you know, lots of, um, people arose against uh, racism, but solidarity eventually fizzled out. Uh, and this, we cannot sustain for whatever, you know, moments of resistance comes and then uh, solidarity rises and fizzles out. So my stipulation is that we need some kind of a, uh, uh, some kind of thing that, you know, brings us together, love is one, but, how do we bring it to, I mean, this book is a, a very big contribution towards that, but how do we sustain this kind of conversation? You know, um, it will be, can, can you guys comment on that? So that's my, my, my pitch uh, for, this, uh, for this talk today, because I was really amazed by the, I didn't read the entire thing, like I said, but I was really amazed by the, by the entire contribution and how we can approach struggle, resistance today. Uh, from a different approach. And this is the approach that's really, uh, that's going to be sustainable. Uh, that's going to be, you know, moving forward, we have to really change our approach of resistance. And I think this is the way to do it. So this is a big contribution, but how do we sustain this kind of conversation? It would be nice if you, any of you can comment on that. So I have two oh, quick, uh, yeah, let me just You're have two me. very okay. quick responses to uh, the question, uh, the, the very difficult issue you're raising, Elizabeth. Um, one, I think what might be, I mean, if, if we look within older modes of resistance, then um, the one area that's really worth exploring and beginning to try and understand as a sort of continuity from there, as I see it, at least our students' movements, 
I find that students' movements and young people's movements all over the world carry with them, uh, I mean, perhaps the forms of solidarity making are different uh, and, and the ways in which they're coming together is uh, not within, say, the earlier kinds of modes of organizational histories that we know in terms of even students' movements, but they still are uh, a sort of palpable force and I think we do need to engage that. But the second part, you know, the way you ended your uh, thought uh, I mean, I think we do actually have to imagine new forms of resistance. I mean, I don't think that one can work with those old kinds of ideas. It doesn't work in this world, at least in the world that I inhabit. Uh, one of the things that we see all the time is um, how fragmented we are. It's very difficult to come together. Um, sometimes you come together in terms of uh, a particular short-term workforce kind of thing. Uh, you more and more resistance in at least in this country turns towards the judiciary as a sort of way of intervening, uh, which is, um, I mean, I cannot think of a more uh, non-revolutionary way to address political crisis. So I, I think there are uh, very serious issues that we are actually facing in different parts of the world, but um, I thought Black Lives Matter really was very inspiring given the fact that it seemed to have been, to use an older term, very organic. Uh, it didn't seem to have identifiable leaders. People came together. There was a sort of outpouring of, you know, emotion. Um, that's what cemented uh, relationships between people who absolutely didn't know one another at all. So, you know, yeah. Thank you. But yes, that is really a question one is thinking of. Yeah. Thank you so much. Anybody else? And uh, before I say goodbye, but um, Salah Hassan to host and panelists, solidarity is being criminalized today more than ever before. Uh, Sarah Yassi has also said thank you uh, for this discussion. It has illuminated my day. Many thanks also for answering my question. Both answers have given me fantastic starting points to delve into further. Um, Yvonne King, Professor Georges, I think social media does not assist us with the issue you raised because I think that activists today view social media as a reality, unlike back in the 1960s, 1970s, pre-social media, when activists had a real sense of the people. Well, on that note, if you, don't, if you guys don't have any comments, I will say goodbye. Hopefully, we'll, uh, this book will circulate uh, everywhere. It, a must, a must read. Uh, uh, a question. Uh, yes. Uh, where were you? It's a question. A question in the on there. Okay. Okay. By Ali or Mustafa. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, you have a question in there. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I didn't see. Okay, Ali or Mustafa Lawan. My question to Professor Majid: The poetry of revolution speaks about pain, sadness, and suffering, while the poetry of love relates to joy happiness and pleasure, which, which one is more expressive in the poetry of Muhammad Iqbal? <laughs> Javed, uh, Javed, I think it's for you. <laughs> so you're on mute, you're on mute. Can you, you're on mute, Javed. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, sorry. Yeah, that's uh, uh, a difficult question. I mean, I, I don't actually, to be honest, um, you know, I've done, I've done quite kind of detailed readings of Iqbal's poems. And one of the things I try to suggest in my reading, in both my book and in my reading room in the essay is that the love that's expressed in his poetry is very much a metaphysical philosophical uh, concept. Uh, it is the concept of ishq rather than mohabbat. And um, in that sense, I would slightly disagree with you because mm, I think it's more a philosophical concept of love related to a project of selfhood uh, rather than a visceral expression, uh, rather than the, than the viscerality or exi existential realities of, of, of it. So, uh, I mean, my response is more that I kind of slight, I disagree with how you're characterizing Iqbal's poem, uh, poems, uh, po 
yeah, his poetry there. And also the question of pleasure is interesting in Iqbal because again, I my reading is probably different from yours. I think Iqbal's poetry is very much about the disciplining of pleasure. Uh, and I, I, I think the very tight control he has of the metrical form, so he uses meter in a very different way from Fez. The very tight control he has of the metrical form, I think is a, an attempt to codify and discipline the disruptive possibilities of pleasure. So you have this odd experience reading Iqbal of kind of experiencing the expansive nature of oceanic imagery alongside the closing down of that imagery through, through the tight form of the couplet. Whereas in Fez, the, the way he uses meter, uh, uh, I mean, to cut a long story short, his use of meter leads to a kind of different aesthetic experience when it comes to uh, kind, kind of emotive uh, 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 possibilities. If you like, his use of meter, although, although control, it's controlled, uh, is some is looser in many ways, and I'll just you know I'll just end on that note. So I kind of, if you like, disagree with the premise of the question, but it's a really interesting and thought-provoking question. Thank you. You can, okay. you can also say that we can easily okay. switch the the uh, the question to say that the poetry of love speaks of pain, sadness, and suffering, yeah. and, and poetry of revolution speaks of happiness and pleasure, and, and, it's, and that still works, right? <laughs> because yeah. it's truly the, that, that kind of space in which uh, it's hard to create those kind of mutually ex exclusive yeah. sort of ways of understanding pain and pleasure, you know, and, yeah. and I think possibly uh, uh, if I am uh, not all off base here, uh, the whole sort of mystical dimension of Iqbal's poetry is all about, you know, not creating that kind of distinction between pain and pleasure yeah. and, uh, and sure. happiness and sadness, you know, that's yeah. at the, so we are talking about the same thing there. And, and just to very quickly add, I mean, I, I think that when I uh, kind of yeah, speak to undergraduates about fairs, I make them also read Herbert Marcuse and mm -hmm. the whole question about the politics of pleasure, because in many ways, I think there is a politics of pleasure in fairs. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can read his poetry in relation to Marcuse, I think, in all kinds of ways. Yeah. Great. Um, so there's another question before that. This was so soothing, critical, and very insightful. Thank you. So as soon as I'm getting, I was getting ready to close it. Questions are coming up. So from Jai, from Hiro, look, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, Okando. Can I ask about the panel's opinion about the oral traditions of love and struggle poetry in societies such as Haiti that both enhance and reflect the diversity of experience in post-colonial settings? Uh, University of Sharjah, oh, she's local, University of Sharjah. Okay, so can I, uh, anybody wants to take that? It's not addressed to anybody particular. Um, I think that okay. uh, just to say, if I can respond to that. Um, firstly, following on from what uh, we've been saying about how, how to continue, okay, how to carry things forward. Um, there, there's something very, in the way that we did these workshops, it was a kind of traveling, it was traveling theory, it was tra uh, traveling libraries, it was um, spending time in each other's spaces. And I, I have to say that it's those moments of, sort of off platform and quieter conversations where you learn a tremendous amount about many invisible struggles that have gone on. And I, I especially want to um, acknowledge uh, the extraordinary amount that I learned probably through osmosis <laughs> from spending time with um, 
with Anu, Professor Arunima um, in Delhi and elsewhere. And I, th I think there's something very suggestive about um, Beirut's what you're talking about on, on these smaller scales, these, these linked things, these micro spaces that are, um, may seem isolated and remote. And this question about oral traditions of Haiti is, is absolutely beautifully promising and would be so extraordinary to continue um, with this, this mechanism of the, the meetings, the dialogues that can move around and have both formal and informal components to it. Um, you know, sort of multifaceted. And so I would be very excited by a possibility of Haitian contribution to this, this um, dialogue. Um, there's resonances with African oral traditions. There's again, a problem of periodizations that things like oral tradition get locked into that time prior to the colonial moment, which is all actually crazy uh, mm -hmm. because they do continue in very, um, they have remarkable afterlives, uh, even in the phases of um, post-colonial life. So I, I really want to say that uh, we here in Cape Town are ready and always available to continue thinking together about assembling further possibilities for these kinds of conversations. And, you know, thanks to the uh, vision and very hard work of Pramesh in particular, you know, there are now also <coughs> very friendly spaces which are designed <coughs> for these kinds of partnerships to flourish. Um, in, in new parts of Cape Town that um, the university has secured for, for, for these kinds of possibilities. So, um, you know, the door, the door is open. Um, yes, just to say that. Come back, Beirut, come back, Javed. Uh, come back, Anu, it's been too long. <laughs> Elizabeth. <laughs> yeah, me too. But come here too. I mean, the collaboration is open, as Salah said right. earlier. It would be very, it would be very, it would be a pleasure for us to host you here on your individual works. Uh, so we will keep communicating. We'll keep the, the communication open and see what we can do further with the Institute here as well. Uh, so I don't think there's any more questions, but uh, thank you to Pramesh for, or, you know, for organizing uh, this. Uh, and I'm really grateful for this book uh, and hope that we continue the conversation along this line, like Anu said, uh, we have to really change the approach of struggle. It's not working out, obviously, uh, what, we have, what we've been doing for after independence, particularly for the continent, you know, the last 60, 70 years. Uh, so this book is a, was a great, great uh, insight. Uh, and thank you, Javed and Beru, you just gave it more depth you know, you gave you, you enlightened us even more. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm going to say goodbye, um, unless anybody has to wants to say anything. Uh, and thank you all for participating.